This special Cambridge Tech Week episode is sponsored exclusively by KO Data. Welcome to the Cambridge Tech Podcast, talking all things technology from the heart of the UK's tech capital. Here are your hosts, Faye Holland and James Parton. Hello, I'm Faye. And I'm James. Welcome to this very special live episode of Cambridge Tech Podcast. Indeed. So when we decided to do this live episode, we thought long and hard about what the topic was going to be and what we thought you would all be interested in. I think it's fair to say I did a usual Faye and I flip-flopped multiple times on what the subject was. So we'd come to to a meeting and James would say, what are we doing? And I've changed my mind again. So we did kind of leave it quite late in in the end. But it all boiled down to one fact, and that is that Cambridge's prowess isn't new. It's actually been going on for decades. And so we really wanted to pick a topic that built on that legacy. And that was our starting point. It was. Um, We did some research. I'm sure many of you are aware of the two brilliant books by Charles Cotton and Kate Kirk, and we'll put the links to those in the show notes. We've had lots of conversations with various people around the ecosystem. David Gill is one of those people. He's got so much experience of what's happened in Cambridge over the years, and David's actually coming on to do his own episode shortly with us on the history of science parks in Cambridge. And there's also a whole host of other people we've talked to on the podcast too. So like Tim Minchell, if any of you heard that episode, he was on and he was really challenging us to say, what should Cambridge be known for? And then we were also, I think a lot of you will be involved in Innovate Cambridge. I know that we certainly are. And that's a work with Tabitha Goldstorb. Cambridge Innovation Capital and Cambridge Enterprise, which is about what's the purpose of Cambridge and what should we be known for? So yeah, we've certainly had lots of inspiration for the discussion. And this is where the idea of 40 years of Cambridge Tech came from. The list really starts with Cambridge Consultants, which actually is more than 40 years ago. That's actually back into the 60s, followed by Acorn Computers, Domino, Sinclair Research in the 70s, and companies like Qualcomm in the 80s. So 40 years mean we're starting in the 90s. And you're undoubtedly going to recognise many of those companies, Zar, Abcam, Frontier Development, CSR, lots of companies in different industries. But also it was when ARM was started, which takes us to our first panellist today, Jamie Urquhart, who was part of the founding team of ARM Holdings from its inception in November 1990 until November 2002. You were in place there. Um, Since ARM, Jamie has kept busy as an angel investor, venture partner, holds many board positions and is a mentor to so many people across Cambridge. So welcome, first of all, to Jamie. Thank you. It's all very news night, isn't it? Okay, so then we get to the noughties. So we we see Raspberry Pi, Audio Analytic, Ubisense, Redgate Software, Real VNC, and Feature Space. Join the ever-growing list. So Martina King joins us four years after it started as CEO and has been in place ever since. Feature Space is now the world's leading provider of enterprise financial crime prevention software and has raised more than 100 million in funding. So we're looking forward to hearing more from Martina t- in today's episode. Welcome, Martina. So those of you highly intelligent amongst us will understand our logic here, which will mean we're into the 2010s now. So this is when I think things really started to hot up. And that's because it's not just the next rounds of investment that were coming through and entrepreneurs coming out of the university, but we also started to get what's called the generation two, generation three businesses that were coming out of those really early stage um, businesses. So you can almost split this decade into two. The first part of it, you've got companies like Pragmatic, Darktrace. And if you think about it, they haven't been going that long. So, you know, really impressive names, Cambridge Quantum, we had Ilias on as well, didn't we? Geospock, Riverlane, those types of companies. And then the latter part of that decade, it seemed to explode again with companies like Fetch AI, RoboK, Zampler, Cambridge GAN Devices, Fluso, Better Origin, and on and on that list goes. Apologies for everyone that I've missed out. So from this decade, we have our next guest, which is 
Adam Durant, who is CEO of Cetavia, who is tackling the climate impact of flights. Welcome, Adam. Thank you. Hi. Last but no means least, up to 2018, we've got Umaima Malik Ahmed, who is the CEO and co-founder of MedTech company 52 North, which launched in 2018. And they're focused on reinventing the healthcare journey, starting by transforming cancer care with NeuroCheck. Welcome, Umaima. So that's the introduction to today's podcast. So we're going to get the panelists nice and warmed up, ready for your questions. So we're going to ask them a question each and we're going to start with Jamie. So Jamie, you've pretty much seen everything in the in the last few decades in your time here in Cambridge. How do you think that tech companies have changed and are changing? I can't claim to have seen everything because uh, I've been traveling the world selling things. But I think one of the biggest changes I've seen is the environment has become more entrepreneurial. So we, we formed Arm. We couldn't get any VC money. Hiring people into Cambridge was difficult, particularly marketing people. You know, why do they want to come to a sleepy little uh, bywater like uh, Cambridge? And we used to say, we need to be out in the world stage, not messing around with some of the, the stuff that's happening in Cambridge. You know, they're, they're worrying about traffic and such like. Important, but we've got other fish to fry. The other thing we, we used to talk about, and it's rude, but I'll say it anyway, is we used to sometimes accuse some of our Cambridge-educated staff of Cambridge black hole thinking. They would come upon a problem, and instead of doing what I would do, chat about it, see if anybody else has got an idea... They'd sort of spiral down, trying to work ever more closely into the problem. We used to publicly berate it, not the individuals, but we try and stop that. And we try and get them to think, well, talk to a customer, talk to someone else. And, you know, when some of the buildings we had put up, we deliberately placed the kitchens all around so that they would bump into people. They would discuss things. Creativity doesn't just come from an individual. It comes from people working together. And uh, we found that was very effective. So that's one of the changes I've seen. The availability of uh, venture capitalist money has been amazing. Arm started on $2.75 million. Startups get more in seed funding than we did. I agree it's quite a long time ago. <laughs> in my later life, I've been involved with a lot more with startups coming out of the university. That's been really heartening. Uh, it takes something to sometimes change your postdoc's idea of well, should I really be doing this? Is it uh, is it a good thing to do or not? But also, I've seen more sustainable ideas coming out of the university. There's a much more awareness of what we need to do overall, rather than just oh, I want to make some money. I want to you know have fun building a business, which is also really good. I think that's a nice segue then to Martino. Question for you: What has been your experience with commercialising technology, and how can we do more as an ecosystem to encourage? more entrepreneurship and to, and to develop more world-class companies like Future Space? Well, the first thing is it's really hard. <laughs> Once you find that you've got the genius or the technology invention, you've then got to find your way in the world and you've got to find the use case. And that takes a huge amount of effort. And I can remember that for us taking over two years sort of trying to remain optimistic with everybody. Yes, we're going to get there and you're being optimistic with your board and you're being optimistic with your team and, you know, we'll get there. And then quietly at home, so going, will somebody throw us a bone? You know, can somebody give us a glimmer of hope, please? You know, but all you can do is be resilient and keep going. You know, at the same time as watching companies like DMIT getting snapped up for 400 million somethingers or others, and that was for the brain power that was the potential of, of that team. But our way of working has been to find a use case, something where we could bring machine learning to the world, a, a service for good, and to win the confidence of customers one by one by one by one. And then you build the muscle memory into your product and then you can start to really crank it into a product led company. And then once you get to there, you can really start to scale. So the commercializing of it is it is a tough thing to do, particularly when you're trying to tell everybody that there's a brand new way of doing something in the world that they've not heard of before. And that takes an awful lot of individuals 
and then customers who are the mavens out there who will be brave and say, I'm going to take a chance. And then you catch those people and hold on to them. And then you prove the value of the technology. And then you've got something that can be really game changing. So I think you've got to be determined, brave, and then you just need, I totally endorse what Jamie said, really good commercial people that can help you take the company global. That's great. Thank you. So if we turn to Amima and we look at your company, you're really at the start of your journey, you know, your very early years. What do you think have been the key things that Cambridge has done to help you and that you think that maybe other places could replicate? Thanks, Faye. Um, so our story wouldn't have happened anywhere else. Um, and so it was really the fact that four of us from very different disciplines were all studying postgrads at the University of Cambridge, having come from all parts of the world. And I think there were three key things here that enabled our story to actually happen and go from being an idea to something on paper to something uh, in a lab um, and you know something that's now going into clinical trials. The first part of that is the the accelerator programs that are available here. So places like Cambridge Judge Business School run an accelerate program, um, and there are lots of other incubators uh, that that are taking place here, and they really help to provide that early education about things like shareholder agreements and building a company. There's very early stage pieces that. No matter how much work you've done in other industries, um, if you've never founded your own company, you just don't know where to start. But I think the second part is 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 really crucial to go along with the accelerator, and that's proof of concept funding. So these are amounts that don't they can be quite trivial, uh, so to speak. You know, in a, in a place like this, maybe a thousand pounds, ten thousand pounds. For us, we uh, took part in the 2018 Cambridge Postdoc Business Plan competition and won our first investment through that, so that was £10,000. And that's what enabled us to actually do our very first sort of proof of concept experiments and actually prove that this was a potential solution that could possibly work. And it doesn't need to be a great deal of work, but it was enough to provide us with the conviction that we could do it and to go out and apply for grants. And so after that 10,000, we were able to get a 100,000 Innovate grant and, and so on. So it really sort of enabled that flow to, to happen. So I think proof of concept funding alongside accelerators is really, really important. Otherwise, people, you know, build out business plans and uh, know what they're supposed to do. But if there's no money to help roll it and, and, and you know, unless you can bankroll it yourself, it can be quite tricky. And then I think the final part of that um, that makes Cambridge very special and, and it definitely can be replicated in other, in other cities across the country is the um, the ecosystem. So I think without companies like Arm, like Future Space, like Satavia, we wouldn't really be able to picture with conviction the trajectory that our companies could take. And I think, you know, very early on in our journey, for example, we went to an entrepreneurship competition here in Cambridge where we met a uh, Cambridge angel who really liked what we did and took us under his wing. Um, so that's Richard Palmy, um, and he's a very successful entrepreneur. And he offered to advise us and, you know, to answer the phone and, and meet with us in person and, and guide us. And that moment was where we really felt that actually what we had was credible, even though it was an idea at the time. So having that kind of, you know, the the people who've done it uh, and are there and still doing it and have gone much further than you around you is, I think, really important for you to be able to see what you can become and to have the conviction that you can do it. Because without really having that um, sort of vision into the future, it's difficult. But also because having that kind of ecosystem around you of these amazing companies who've done um, brilliant things and, you know, are showing how the UK can compete at a global level enables you to um, source talent as well. So when it comes to building your board and getting advisors and NEDs, et cetera, um, you know, th those those are the places you look, you try to, to learn from the things that they've done um, and, you know, get advice from those people. And I think entrepreneurship is very much a continuous learning journey, whether it's the start of your journey or, or you're at the IPO stage, it's always something new. And so th those factors together really is what enables people to seed ideas to to prove that they could work and and have the confidence to roll forward with them and and you know give up jobs and 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 take the risk that that feels very um uh, yeah manageable in that sense thanks Amaya. um adam startup wisdom says the most successful startups are solving real problems um you're obviously doing this with climate tech but as a first mover you have that kind of burden of educating the market so how are you approaching that challenge yeah, that's a great question. Um, so 
it's a big part of being sort of first to market with a new idea. Quite often you find yourself talking to customers, investors who don't realize there's a problem. Um, and, and so, um, just to sort of echo some of Martina's words, you've really got to have a lot of resilience and, um, keep going. It's about endurance and, and keep having those meetings and keep, keep talking to people. Um, but of course you've got to be certain that in the first instance, you're, you have a problem to solve. So yeah, we, we have an interesting story. So I came from academia. I worked at the university as a postdoc. I did many postdocs actually. Uh, in a very short period of time, and it was it was looking at things from spanning um, volcanic eruptions through to climate change and trying to measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere with at the time state of the art sensor technology. And then there was a volcanic eruption in Iceland. Probably everyone remembers 2010. Grounded European aviation. You were either at home and you couldn't leave the country, or you were somewhere else and couldn't get back for for a whole week. And depending on where you were. Uh, either you were in a, or near a beach and it was a good thing or you were somewhere else and you needed to get a taxi across Europe to get home. Um, but that led to me getting involved in a, in a, in a company uh, spun out of the Norwegian Institute for Air Research. I worked alongside Airbus and EasyJet on ash detection. Um, and that, that sort of inspired me to form Satavia. Um, so we got support from the European Space Agency. The idea was really to um, bring the best of atmosphere and climate science to aviation to solve use case problems. Uh, the first use, use case inspired by volcanic ash was how the atmospheric environment can damage aircraft engines. So we created data, we tracked aircraft and we sold it to OEMs like Rolls-Royce, for example. So uh, echoing some of Imama's uh, words, it really helped being in Cambridge, um, being in some of these programs like Judge, uh, Ignite, Accelerate Cambridge, meeting people like Jamie, who helped us have those first meetings with 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 customers and a lot of it is is really talking to them explaining you know the problem and and how science and technology that exists today could be applied to solve those problems and so that goes right the way through the selling process and then once you find yourself with a bit of early success around sales you might start talking to investors and you go through the same process uh, and then after that you, you might get into regulatory type discussions. So, so where we find ourselves today is, um, well, having focused on how the, the atmosphere damages aircraft and building up products around condition monitoring and predictive maintenance, we had COVID, which suddenly, again, grounded the global fleet of aircraft and this time actually killed off our product almost overnight. Um, but luckily, we had something else in the pipeline which turned into helping aircraft operators um, reduce the non-CO2 climate impact of flying. So this is the clouds that aircraft make, and that actually turns out to be possibly a bigger problem than the CO2 emissions. So from 2020, 2021, we've been focused on on that. And again, being ahead of the regulation, it's starting to form now, but all of our early customer discussions were mainly education. Then we find our early adopters, we found that in the Middle East through Etihad and Emirates. More recently, we've worked with KLM and KLM City Hopper, uh, the European mission training scheme now is is putting a tender out to do uh, a monitoring reporting and verification system on non-co2 so so now we find ourselves suddenly in an issue that's come to the fore of, of aviation so the next step is basically staying alive long enough to to get to the next phase of growth but yeah it's an interesting journey every day is different going back to one of the early things you said there just because i'm nosy um you said you've done loads of postdocs almost too many how many and do you have another one in you? I can't remember. Okay, <laughs> but they, it, it got to the point where they were somewhere like six months in duration, fixed term contracts. And, and that in itself can be very unsettling. Uh, and you kind of just, you, you know, that was one of the reasons I left academia, to be honest, was was the insecurity of being a, a postdoc researcher. Right. It was, yeah, it was tough. But then, you know, <laughs> here we are uh, yeah. in entrepreneurship and uh, every day is different. Yeah, and that's it. And going back to what Martina was saying, it is uh, the ability to change, to adapt, to persevere, all of those things, isn't it? So thank you for everyone with the, your first questions answered. Let's throw it over to the audience. Thank you so much for that. That was uh, really insightful. And uh, thank you also for the shout out to the Accelerate programme. So my name is Babita Debbie. I'm a coach on the programme. 
and I work on the Ignite program as well as a mentor. Um, my question is around how do we support some of the early stage ventures to not have to go through that hustle that you have to, I know that there's a level of that in entrepreneurship, but Cambridge is such a close knit community and you're only ever one step removed from somebody who can help you. So how do we create, how do we create an environment where we can really nurture that to the next level? I think it starts with your product market fit. So it depends on the problem that you're solving and then where the customers are. So I think it's hard for people to be able to make those introductions for you in Cambridge if they if those markets aren't known. So nothing can really replace the hustle, unfortunately. However, there's expertise that sits around that and encouragement that sits around that. And I've received a great deal of that from the Cambridge network that I belong to um, and the investors that we have early stage and have remained with us through the journey. Um, and when you hit those moments where you think, well, oh, I need I need somebody to give me a you know just a an arm around the shoulder just a bit of more encouragement keep going I've found that to be incredibly valuable from our board and then you know for me I was lucky enough to have Mike Lynch as an early investor in the company and of course he's not just a fantastic Cambridge entrepreneur but he's very famous for being able to commercialize the technologies that we develop in Cambridge so I was able to learn an awful lot from his experiences as well so I have to say, I think it's more the training development uh, that you get here in Cambridge and the support, but the, the there's no replacement for the actual hustle of having to go out and knock on the doors and find somebody who's going to support you. Uh, I think the two other things maybe. The first is I felt very fortunate with the founder of Feature Space, uh, Bill Fitzgerald, along with Dave Xelly's PhD student, but he developed a brain tumour and died in 2014. And... Uh, I felt that there was a tension in the company where we were driving it to be commercial and yet an awful lot of the early academics in the business weren't quite so comfortable with that. But Bill gave us permission. He said when he was dying, he said, Martina, can you help us make our company as commercially successful as I have been academically? And so that gift that he offered to us made that our mission for the business. And so it really united lots of different styles and types of people around a commercial objective. Um, and I found that incredibly, although desperately sad, in a very great lasting gift he gave us. If I could just add on that, um, I, I, I agree with everything you said there, Martin. I think the I remember the first ever business plan that we developed was um, uh, six months of work. Um, and I think we scrapped it as soon as we got to the next stage because it was awful looking back. Um, but you know it does it does take a lot at the, at the beginning to develop that product market fit, know what your potential regulatory or commercial strategy might be. Um, and I think Cambridge is really great in the sense that it has those um, organisations around us, like um, another another set of organisations with the academic health science networks. Um, so Eastern Age Centre has been really crucial to us in terms of getting connected to other bigger organisations, um, potential customers. So they made an introduction for us to Macmillan Cancer Support by holding a showcase event um, and that was a, about two years ago and that was the first point at which they Macmillan found out about the work that we were doing and then we started working with them and subsequently they became uh, we became their first ever investment so it was it was the exposure that we were given through the the industry the connection and the ecosystem here but I think one thing I would say and this is probably a learning from seeing this similar activity in the US versus what takes place here in the UK and I think there is a a great amount of information available here in Cambridge on sort of the the theoretical side, very academic, but not so much on the the soft skill side. And I think that's something um, having you know seen how British pitches are versus US pitches, and they always say. Um, I think I was at I was at an event hosted by the Department for Business and Trade recently, where they were saying you know if you go to the US, do not talk about the weather. It's, you know, all the Brits do that. We, you know, that's just natural starter conversation for us. But they just go straight in with the ask and say, OK, this is what I'm building. I'm looking for this much investment. Um, and I think we probably need to learn to do a bit more of that. You know, that's probably a bit of the hustle, but it is a soft skill that doesn't really come very naturally if you've been raised here in the UK. No, I often will ask people, you know, who'd like their children to have a career in sales. And you find a lot of very slopey shoulders. But actually... If you look at the US, you can get a professorship in selling and salesmanship. 
And it's a really, really important skill. And none of our companies would be successful without it. So I think we need to embrace that skill set and really encourage uh, that as a a, a learning uh, for everybody in order to be able to be successful. If we can't, we were so brilliant at inventing technology, particularly here in Cambridge, but if we can't tell the story and we can't encourage others to engage and buy it, then it will never reach its full potential. But isn't this actually a societal problem? The US, it's, yeah, you want to make money, you want to succeed, you want to be successful. Here in the UK, uh, we're just a little bit too polite and you want to be an academic or a doctor and that's wonderful even though doctors aren't paid enough. It's a culture change that you need to get. It's bizarre because if you look at people who go into academia and do research, they've got to go out and raise money, they've got to sell their ideas, they've got to communicate their ideas, but somehow or other they think that's different from running a business. Mm. Now, it's interesting, your, your point. I think about sales. When we started Arm, I was a chip designer, I still am a geek, but someone had to do sales and I had a suit and I was less weird than <laughs> some of my colleagues. So I took on the role. And for me, that was a big worry. It's like, am I going to abandon what I'm good at to do something really different? Anybody thinking of going into sales, it was a really, really enjoyable time. You are selling yourself. It's a, in a startup because you haven't got much in the way of products to sell. You build relationships with people. So I still keep in touch with some of the people in Samsung uh, in Korea that I knew 30 years ago. Um, and it's really important. And people talk about the importance of marketing, which I think is important. But ultimately, the rubber's got to hit the road. And one of the things I learned about selling uh, in the type of selling arm did is about relationship. And it's about building relationships. And it's about listening to the customer. And I tell the, the postdocs that I talk to, we were given... Uh, one mouth and two ears, we should be listening to our customers more than we're speaking to them. What happens is after a while when you're selling, you kind of forget this and just want to hear your voice. So I'll stop my answer at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, I just have to say I love that. The, the, I had a suit and I was less weird than my colleagues. That's, that's cracking. Are you a data-driven business looking for resilient infrastructure, connectivity, and the power to compute sustainably? KO Data develops and operates high-performance, energy-efficient data centers for advanced computing. Our scalable, state-of-the-art facilities support the mission-critical workloads of life sciences, biotech, and AI startups across the Cambridge Tech Cluster. To find out how we can help host your compute, get in touch at kodata.com slash contact. KO Data, proud to sponsor the Cambridge Tech Podcast. Hi there, um, I'm Daniel Deering from St. John's Innovation Centre. So I, I wanted to say, if you're spinning out a company from part of Cambridge University or, or from academia, it seems like there's a very effective kind of machine that helps you do that, Cambridge Enterprise all of the accelerators, you know, start code on deep tech labs, accelerate Cambridge and all the other, you know, investment facilities and everything. And I, I guess the question is, if you're a kind of a Fred in a shed inventor who has never heard of any of the colleges in Cambridge, do you think you see the same kind of support ecosystem? Perhaps, Jamie, I might direct that question to you. Yeah, so I didn't go to Cambridge University. I went to a modern place that was, you know, doing more modern things, which is why I went to them. So I talk to people who aren't out of Cambridge. So Impulse, Ignite, they get people from around the world coming into them, um, and they can engage in the same sorts of things. And very often, they're less identical. You know, they have they different behaviors. Uh, I had one I mentored who absolutely hustled. He knew how to hustle. Uh, he got his own website set up. He was using it to get partnerships going. And his biggest problem was not doing the business. It was how was he going to scale? I mean, he, he couldn't do it all himself. He needed to employ people. And that was the biggest challenge. So it is possible. I don't think it's quite as easy. 
and certainly the Cambridge name, uh, the university name has a brand that will get interesting uh, interest from investors. And of course, the the various of the these things you talk about funnel in uh, investors to listen to the pitches, and more than once they I've seen them invest in the companies. I have also taken part in in as far afield as Ipswich, <laughs> and. Um, they do the same things, um, and one of the reasons I went over there, I was invited, and I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll go and see. Uh, and and it's encouragement, but I don't think it's the same all-enveloping sort of wraparound that you get here in, in Cambridge. It's easy to get into it. Uh, I, I forgot to mention Enterprise Tuesday. Of course, they also invite people from outside. But I have friends who've tried to start businesses in the area, and they are not part of the uh, ecosystem, and they do definitely find it harder. I think also if you you know previous episodes on the podcast you were really careful who we get on the podcast to show a diverse mix so like last week's episode was stratospheric platforms who are not a Cambridge University spin out we've got Infosense Intellisense are coming on um Orcascan you know there's there's quite a lot but the the key to all of them if you have a conversation with them is they all come here to plug themselves into the ecosystem. So it may be slightly harder. You're not doing what Amami's doing while you're going through all of those steps, you know, Chris Abel, postdoc, and on and on it goes. Um, but I think if you're willing to come to Cambridge and plug in, you can still get a lot of that benefit. Yeah, I could just add, because we're, we're not actually a Cambridge spin out. And I, even though I was a postdoc here, I actually moved to Norway for three or four years and decided to come back for the many attributes of, of the ecosystem, you know, finding talent, finding mentors, the brand, the brand has actually been just Cambridge itself has been really, um, really valuable. It's, it's something you can say almost immediately when you go and speak to someone as a customer an investor, we're, we're from Cambridge. We do of course benefit from access to programs like Cambridge Accelerate, Ignite, that's been invaluable really for building those initial skills you need as an entrepreneur and it's really valuable being able to do that at at no cost or at low cost so that you can basically come in learn the skills you need to to learn build a network you could have the option at that point to try and bootstrap or you could potentially go and find investors and i, I think it's absolutely right that the, the university is a key part of what makes Cambridge so special and why it's been so successful over so many years. But I think it's the right question because we need to be mindful that it's, there's equitable access to the kinds of support services av available in the city. I mean, to build on Adam, Adam's point, the last time I ran the data for here in the Bradfield Centre, we've got something like 600 members and less than 40% have been to Cambridge University. So we do see quite a diverse range of people coming into the city. So it's kind of I think, front of mind to make sure that they get access to the kinds of services that they need to be successful as well. But using a biological idea, you get hybrid vigor when you combine two different uh, strains. I think, uh, and I didn't really say this when Faye asked me the question first, but one of the things I saw in the 90s were more people coming into the Cambridge cluster. You know, we had large companies uh, drawing people in as well. And as a consequence, it changed the culture uh, in terms of it's perfectly reasonable to be a bit more entrepreneurial and it isn't all about Cambridge. I have to praise the university for what it now does in terms of helping students but a, a lot of that is also available for other people and maybe we just need to get better at telling them it's available, it's there, you know, you're more than welcome and, and get people taking on the services. But one of my venture capitalist colleagues said, God, I wish people wouldn't go to these sorts of courses. It's much more difficult for us to tell her which, which ones are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones. So the pros and cons. It's fair to say we benefited from the Cambridge brand, right? We've spent literally zero pounds on marketing the podcast. And, uh, you know, a third of our audience is in the United States. Yeah. So that's just, a, that's the Cambridge brand, right? Um, Chris Ellis, I'm a... Innovate UK Edge Scale Up Director working out of St John's as well. Um, first of all, Jamie, thank you so much for getting on the road and selling um, as a shareholder in Arm in 1999. You made me a shed load of money. Um, you I'll can be, buy me a drink. I, I, absolutely, it's the least I can do. 
I, I was going to, the question I was going to ask, so this um, current initiative around Cambridge, Innovate, Innovate Cambridge, it's, it's about place marketing. It's about trying to find the personification, the characterization of, of Cambridge to uh, take it further, farther, higher, and, and kind of externalize it in a kind of brand centric way. So that, if you think about that as a person, if Cambridge is a person, what does the 40 year old Cambridge tell the 15 year old Cambridge if they could look back? I'm older than 40, so. <laughs> If no one else is going to do it, I've had to do this and I've had to, uh, not had to, but I've done it with my children because they've grown up here uh, and work experience. They've both worked at ARM as well as it happens. I like to think that you want to be happy. Find something to do that makes you happy, doing something that is meaningful. And I know this might sound odd coming from, you know, one of the, the founders of ARM, which made a lot of money for people, but it's not all about money. A lot of it is about self-actualization. It's about doing good things, you know, climate change, healthcare. These are societal issues that are really important. And, you know, when someone gets up and says, oh, well, I'm finding a cure for cancer, I've helped launch a billion phones. You know, it doesn't really, it's not quite the same thing. I admire that far more than I admire what I've done. And I think that this is probably a little off podcast, but we ki take kids to school, we force them to take meaningless exams year after year after year after year. Uh, and we have a country that's becoming hostile to people working here, uh, you know, people seeking refuge. I want to see a country where we're much happier, um, we're gainfully employed, and as a result, we create a GDP that is good and it, it helps to both keep people who aren't uh, able to work um, looked after uh, and gives people opportunities to do different things. And so in my career, I started as a chip designer. Well, I, I started actually as a, a hospital cleaner, but that was a brief period of time. <laughs> chip designer. Uh, I then ran the group. I then went into sales. I then was chief operating officer. I then went into, I was a chief strategy officer, then an angel then a VC, and now I'm spending a lot of my time mentoring and helping people uh, do what they want to achieve. And I think the other reminder is that roles change and we do different things over periods of time, and that's healthy. And it's not a job. If you go into something as a job for life, you're probably going to be disappointed. But I also wouldn't knock people for doing that. Chris, if I may as well, I think like it's not about the dollar. It is, you know, it's about creating that impact. And I think that that's a, a lot of what Innovate Cambridge is really trying to pursue. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see later on this year when they present it back, um, what the it actually is. And then the other thing I, I, I would personally like to add is I think it's that you know, looking back, it's that pay it forward mentality, which I think is a huge piece of the magic sauce of Cambridge, um, because that's what helps to support all the businesses as they grow through different stages of their journey. That's just made me think, Faye. So I'm not yet 40, but I will comment as if I were. So 40 year old me would tell 15 year old me that those people in that room who look so scary actually want to help and share their experience. Everybody loves to talk about themselves and want to share what they've learned. And so when you're thinking, oh, can I ask this question to that person who's really important? I mean, absolutely. They, I think oh, there's never been an occasion when I've approached somebody and it hasn't, you know, and asked for some kind of assistance or something. It always turns into something, blooms into something bigger. And, you know, even if it happens 5% of the time, it's always worth a try to see if there is some kind of fit. But generally speaking, people want to share what they've learned and what they've been through and what they can sort of pass on. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's absolutely something that, that I would pass on. Hi, thank you. Um, Steve Thompson, I'm COO at Form the Future. I love hearing about people talk about sales training. My first, after I graduated, was uh, selling pharmaceuticals for Astra Pharmaceuticals before it came AstraZeneca. It's the best training I've ever had, actually. But going back to thinking about talent, um, there was lots of conversation at the sessions yesterday about how difficult it is to build teams in Cambridge. And I just wondered, for those of you who've been running 
very successful companies, how you've how have you built those teams? Have you had to import that talent, grow it locally, develop from within? What's what's been your strategy to get to that growth? I'll go first. Um, it yeah, it's a, a whole combination of things, and I think first of all, it starts with your own reputation. Can you make yourself really attractive to a very highly desirable and intellectual workforce? Uh, and how do you go about achieving that? So, you know, first of all, it starts with the small group of people that you have initially. They go out and tell their friends. And we used to put on events at, uh, at Feature Space. So to start with, uh, we used to hire the Picture House cinema and we'd put on cinema nights and we'd make the tickets free to the university students in the colleges or in the um, departments from where we wanted to um, recruit. So it was really trying to think laterally about how do we start to develop the relationships. We then would always have a summer intern program so we'd be able to recruit and uh, employ through there. We also then kept all lots and lots of connections into the university through the professors that we knew so that they could then uh, promote the company and encourage people to come and find out more about us. So early days, it was having to really think incredibly laterally about how you build a reputation and get your name in front of people as a, as a great place to work. I think over the uh, last five years, the market in Cambridge has just been very, very tough. So trying to hire developers, uh, data scientists, incredibly competitive. And where we'd put budgets together to be able to really grow the numbers of people that we had in our company, we haven't been able to grow the numbers because the investments had to go into our existing team to retain them. And then the whole COVID and working from home, that has thrown a whole host of other challenges. But the opportunity for that is that we now have a lot more uh, remote workers and people that we can recruit from many places around the world. Uh, and then at the same time, we've scaled globally. So we have offices in many parts of the world where we're able to be much more flexible about the input those people can have into the way we are building our technology. But still, the bulk of what we're building on a day-to-day -day basis is here in Cambridge, just across the road. So if anybody knows any really good people, <laughs> we're still hiring. Uh, and then we have an internal recruitment team. So we, we've we made good relationships with local recruiters, but then um, our own internal recruitment team who know our story better than anybody else, getting on the phone and, you know, using LinkedIn to identify individuals and, and go canvas them, I targeting people who would really love to come work with us. Can I chip in on a question around talent and the, the, uh, the labour market in Cambridge? Do you feel the presence of the large US tech giants like Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, is that a good thing for the city or do you think it limits the number of people forming startups or joining startups in the city? Um, well, uh, initially, I was really, really worried about it um, with those enormously deep pockets, uh, almost limitless budgets to be able to throw at people. And, every, and they all arrived more or less at the same time with the exception of Microsoft. So, you know, that was a very frightening time. Uh, in fact, we only lost one person. And I was, you know, thinking about this today because I saw somebody on a panel and it's like, goodness, I was so worried about that. But actually for us, it hasn't, it hasn't become a threat. Uh, so I can't answer for other companies, obviously, but it wasn't the threat that I was worried it was going to be. I guess focusing on if you give great employee experience and fulfilling jobs, then people stay, right? Absolutely. And not everybody wants to work on a in a large organisation. Mm. Um, lots of people want to feel that they're doing something very valuable and they have a, co co a smaller cohort of people that they're working with. Yeah. Um, and that valuable piece, I, I, again, you know, finding a mission that would be incredibly attractive to the millennial generation. I want to work on something that is going to be good for the world, mm. not just about putting something into the cloud or clicking on the next ad. It yeah. was, you know, genuinely finding technology that could do good. And 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 that mission, uh, I think, has really created a bond of people who want to work with this. Yeah. And Amaima, do you think that's the same for you at the very start of the journey? So, yes, absolutely. I think it's been a really positive thing um, because it makes Cambridge more attractive to new talent. And, you know, ideally we'd be stealing people from those companies to come and work with us. I think the value of things like ESOP, so employee share options, probably are, are they're, they're more valued in the US than they are here, I think. And and I think that mindset is slowly changing with the, the focus on like, sort of earlier stage innovation coming out of the UK. 
But those are the kind of things that enable people or smaller companies to compete with packages offered by larger companies. Um, I think it makes it exciting and, and shows that we, you know, we also are playing in this space and and can eventually become one of these companies. And I think there's a sort of the second part to that is just how I think it's important to think about how we present ourselves as companies versus these these tech companies that we're competing with for talent, especially with sort of remote working being a, a very common now. The brand really counts um, how you present yourself. You know, even things like it. If you've got a if you've got a logo that you made on on paint, it's probably not going to attract <laughs> the talent um, that you want. Um, so we do need to think about those things more seriously than I think we've probably done in the past. And I think the final thing I just wanted to say on that was actually one thing that, uh, and this came up in uh, a conversation today at uh, the Cambridge Tech Week, um, a panel session with some investors, which was about how to retain female talent in, and, and, and encourage female um, founders to start companies and, and, and stay uh, with smaller innovative companies. I think one of the things that we find is that a lot of women at earlier stages in their career will make the jump to a corporate because they have really good policies healthcare, private insurance, maternity leave, that's greater than the statutory minimum. And what I found is a lot of startups will actually just provide the statutory minimum. Now, somebody who's planning to have a family is going to prefer nine months or a year of, of paid leave at AstraZeneca or wherever it might be. Um, and so we need to start thinking about those kind of things as well to compete at a policy level as well so that we are retaining this female talent. And I'm really proud to say we've got a 70% female team, which is very unusual in the sector. Um, but, it, you know, it's been spearheaded, you know, by the by the co-founders. Um, and, you know, our board really supports this kind of sort of policy setting, which trying to sort of really establish the way um, that we uh, attract ourselves to, to talent and, and retain them as well. Hi, uh, my name is Zara Jawad. I'm a CEO founder of Chrysalis, which is an antibody therapeutics uh, startup based at Abraham. Um, I just wanted to ask with all these initiatives of like startups, um, really great programs, it definitely wasn't around when I was a student at Cambridge. Um, do we, does the panel think that maybe there are too many startups happening in Cambridge? And is there enough infrastructure in Cambridge to support that startup community? And what do you think might have to change in the future landscape for us to support this kind of level of innovation coming out? Or is that just going to be a natural attrition and, you know, do we accept that? Interesting point. And, you know, we'd mentioned Accelerate earlier. That's been going for 10 years. We've got about, I think, 360 companies that have gone through that program. The statistic I wanted to share is that there's 68% of those companies are still around. So that comment about, you know, the have we got too many startups? It's uh, I'd be really interested to see what the panel think about that. Thanks. See, I, I I'm not on the panel, but hey, I've got an opinion. I I say no, you can't have too many, as long as they all have a purpose. They you know they're all actually creating something that is needed, rather than just being something they've had an idea and then they're trying to find a marketplace for. I think we should absolutely you know stamp down on some of those and that's why some of these programs are good because you can go with one idea and actually find you need to morph it into into something else but I I mean personally I love the whole scale and size of the the you know entrepreneurial spirit of Cambridge so bring it on but I think it's down to product market fit, isn't it? Yeah, you know, sure. the, the market will decide if there's too many startups. You know, the successful ones will be successful and others will fail. But again, that failure is not necessarily a bad thing um, that you can try again. You know, that experience is super valuable. If you go on some of these courses, you are asked to contemplate whether you want to do it or not. Is it the right thing? Does it work with the people around you? And I think that's really important because... From a, a human point of view, I don't want a, people to to end up doing something that they're miserable with. You know, you want people to feel um, it's the right thing to do for them and it works for them. So if all we did was launch a, a billion startups and 90% of them all failed and we created mass misery, I would feel we'd failed. <laughs> and the courses do do this. The ones I've been helping with will ask people to reflect on what their goals in life, why they want to do it, um, and when's the right time. And one criticism, criticism has been that that you know we're getting all these postdocs immediately from postdoc land into trying to start a business, 
and it's a massive cult culture shock. It, it is. But generally, what's happening is, you know, things like Impulse, Ignite, etc., they have the opportunity to, to explore what they're trying to do and think about it. It's not immediately rush out. I think there's a really interesting event that takes place at, at the Judge Business School called Venture Creation Weekends. Um, and that, uh, to me, really signals that absolutely there's no, you know, there's, I don't think there's a limit. What that event does is pull together people from different areas. You can come from any background um, and you're thrown in a room and forced to sort of come up with an idea and you develop it together uh, with people you've probably not met before necessarily. So it's it's being thrown into that testing environment where um, you know you, you do get sort of the business plan on the table and you you do have to come up with a, a strategy for everything and if it doesn't work it doesn't work um, but I, I think that just creates more innovation because it, it makes you think about things and turns cogs that otherwise wouldn't necessarily have turned if you were doing your your nine to five day job at, at a big corporate and isn't that what the UK needs right now I mean you know it's it, it wasn't it, did somebody use the word fail? Um, you know, we have to put that word away from our vocabulary because all we did was we tried. And if we didn't make it, then what are the life learned lessons that you take? And if you go, go and work for a larger employer, actually the empathy that you have with your employer and, and the struggles that they're going through to try and continue to build the business might make you a, a, an even better team member in that larger organization. So yeah, no, I think it's, it, you've got to, you've got to try, you've got to go for it. Why not? It was Thomas Edison, I believe, who said, I have not failed. I have found 10,000 ways that do not work. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and failing isn't a bad thing. No. America, if you haven't failed a few times, you're probably not trying hard enough. Mm. In England, we probably, or Britain, we tolerate a failure, but you can have another go. Yeah. Germany, they won't speak to you ever again. You know, and I'm, that's being a bit stereotypical, but, but it's true. Mm. Uh, it can be seen as a bad thing. And that's one of the things about education. Education is always about competing with all the people in your class, uh, and yet you want to completely change that mindset when you're starting a business and getting people working together. And you want to make it fun for them to interact and realize they're not doing it all on their own. And together, they're going to achieve way more than they could as individuals. Jane Hutchins, Cambridge Science Park. I think that last question from the floor actually had two parts to it. And the part that the panel has not embraced is the um, question about infrastructure. So are there too many startups? The market will determine that. But I think the infrastructure question is crucial, um, not just from a science park perspective, but from the city perspective. This phenomenal growth we've witnessed over the last 40 years has put huge strain on the local population. And I think as a newcomer to Cambridge myself, I've been here less than a year, I'm seeing, yes, celebration of our achievements, but also criticism and alienation of parts of the population. So we, I'm sure we're all aware that we've got the biggest wealth divide in the UK in this one small city. And that wealth divide brings very negative impact on life expectancy, for example. So our neighbours here in Cambridge Science Park are enjoying a significantly reduced life expectancy to about 11 years shorter than the people who probably work on the park. So my question to you is, in the past, I think we've left part of the city behind. What would you do to improve that and to bring the whole Cambridge population along on this journey in the future? I think it's shameful. 11 years. I'm ashamed sitting here to just hear that. I'd pay more tax. Um, we all ought to be ashamed, really, that um, such a divide is in such a small space. And um, I agree there are things we can do, the infrastructure could do with improving. Um, but how do we actually impact so badly people's lives? And if we've got all of this talent here in Cambridge, we should be doing something about it. Maybe we should challenge the university, not because it's their fault, but they are one of the bodies that has influence and uh, they've got economists and all sorts of people who can worry about these sorts of things. But I also think we ought to shame ourselves. Uh, that's happening. There was a question earlier about um, access to programmes for people who are not Cambridge educated. Um, and it was interesting, Jamie, you said perhaps we don't advertise it widely enough. And I think that is a really good point because programmes like Accelerate are open to people from outside of the university. Um, 
And I think that sort of touches on the, the, the question both about Cambridge and inequality within Cambridge, but also more widely in the UK. I think there's a lot that Cambridge could do in terms of sharing um, uh not so much a playbook, but at least the journey that we've followed and and the resources that we have more widely so that this can be sort of replicated, um, but also considering how we can involve um, people who are not linked to the organisations and wouldn't naturally, uh, you know, speak to the people who would encourage them to innovate, um, whether that's through sort of offering apprenticeships that are, are you know, supported by the local, the, the local region or, or otherwise. I think there's a lot of opportunities we, because we're in the healthcare space, so we did see um, actually when we did our very first usability studies um, that we were working with a patient participation group in Addenbrooke's and, and, and a lot of participants were from around Cambridge and those were the people actively coming forward to participate. And there was a bit of a bias in terms of socioeconomic background and, you know, existing knowledge of medical uh, equipment, etc. and, and, and cancer. Um, and so we did actively then go out to seek people from other regions and from different backgrounds. And I think it's really important that we try to do the same. Um, and uh, I'll certainly be taking that home with me for some thought. I live in Martlesham and uh, it's exactly the same discussion. And so we have a, a population explosion and it's just the infrastructure challenge of the country that's taking place at the moment. But our population predicted to continue to grow. So it is something we absolutely have to address. If I then think about Cambridge specifically, I completely see the the gap and where we are on the science park. Um, I just drove around a little while ago and was quite surprised and then learning the statistics, again, surprised. So then I think when you're in an early stage of your company, you're in survival mode yourself. And it's really hard to be benevolent when you're worrying about your own survival every day. But then if your company is successful enough, you get to the point where you can then start to give back. And it's really interesting. Team members will say we should be doing something, but you always need somebody in the organisation to step forward and say, I think this is what we should do. And we had somebody do that and we made a partnership with a local school. And what we dreamed of was just creating an environment where these children could cross a threshold and feel confident and feel that they had access to what was available on the science park and then that we could teach them to dream big. So that's what we've done. We've sponsored the school, we've stayed close to the school and then we've been able to provide money for the children of the school to go on day outings, for instance, that they haven't been, they wouldn't have been able to do without our support and help. Um, and that is very rewarding. Uh, you know, we've, We've got all the fun of being with the kids and then we have on our walls all of the work that they've done with us. So it's a small thing and it's not going to make a big difference, but it might make a difference to one or two kids' lives. And I just think if we can if we can do that outreach and bring a few children along with us, then at least that's something. Thanks, Jane, for the question. I think it's right. You know, we, we celebrate an awful lot, but we have to make sure we bring everyone else along with us so thank you for the question uh, can i just give a shout out to tech educators as well who are a, a new organization from norwich um they're coming into the city they're going to have a coding academy actually here in the bradfield and they target exclusively children that haven't well young adults and career change adults who haven't had the opportunity to go to university coming from less uh, advantageous backgrounds so it's so important that we will try and do as much as we can in that space so i'm really looking forward to so tech educators really helping to address some of that change. So panelists, you are the CEO of Cambridge LTD, and I am challenging you to give one clear, precise objective for Cambridge in 2024. One clear objective for 2024. I mean, my, my instinct is I want to build and contribute to building a lot more really successful British companies that come from Cambridge. And I think achieving that by 2024 might be a bit ambitious, um, but why not? It's not much of a timescale. Two years. It takes two years to design a chip, which isn't the be-all and end-all of life, but it's uh, an example of the problems. I don't know. I've, I've just been listening to the inequalities. Um, I would challenge the community to start reducing the inequalities um, so just echoing that, I think I know you asked for a smart goal. So I would say, I mean, we we've done outreach work as an early startup. We don't have funding to be able to to, to provide 
funding or, or, or support in, in that financial sense. But we do webinars um, which we share actively with schools around Cambridge um, and the East of England. I think outside of that kind of outreach, the, this idea of doing apprenticeships to bring in local workers um, who uh, are not associated with the university, I think there's a lot to be to be taken from that, particularly with the recent change in, in workforce um, over here. There, there is there is so much work that needs to be done, and you know we're hiring from all sorts of places. But I think it would be good to see, for example, every company ensure that you know for every fifteen, ten, or fifteen people they have, they've got one apprentice who's given an opportunity from the local area um, to just help bridge that gap slightly, and you know open open new spaces up to them. Yeah, there's an absolute need to increase the sort of portion of local. Uh, ventures and and that wouldn't necessarily mean it has to be associated with tech or the university. So solving problems for everyday people, increasing um, skills of of the local population. So helping people get the skills they need to set up a business. That's a great way to end the episode as well in terms of, you know, make sure that we're doing the right things for everyone. And we're using our collective might to do good not just in the technologies we develop, but in how we interact with each other. So I think that's a a, a really lovely end. So thank you. That's been a fascinating discussion, talking about so many different um, aspects. And quite frankly, the panel made our job super easy this episode, don't you think? And the audience. Um, Especially. We have hardly said anything all night, which is great. So, yeah, one one last opportunity to thank our panellists. Um, so, Umaima, Adam, Martina, Jamie, please give them a round of applause. <laughs> and I guess the ultimate test is, would you come back if we did this again? Yes. There you go. Oh, okay. That's great. Um, so, that's it. So, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to our panellists again. Thank you to our lovely audience. And we'll see you in the next episode. Today's show was produced by Carl Homer of Cambridge TV and supported by our media partner, Business Weekly. The Cambridge Tech Podcast is available on all major podcast platforms and on cambridgetechpodcast.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please give it a five-star review. It will really help others discover the show. 